My name is Nikki Mitchell. I'm the Executive Administrator for the Associate City Council, and it is Seattle Central's proud honor to welcome uh, Mr. Paul Loeb. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Paul Loeb has been um, researching and writing for over 30 years um, civic engagement and you know what constitutes what makes people choose a life of social service and those who abstain from it. Um, Mr. Loeb has also written five books. Um, I have two of them here, Soul of the Citizen, and The Impossible Will Take a While. Um, he, so he's been highly praised uh, for his work on these books and what they stand for. He has also spoken at over 400 colleges, including Harvard, Dar Dartmouth, uh, MIT, Stanford, and more. And um, today he's going to be leading a workshop on teaching uh, students about civic engagement. And this is really important for students um, and for staff as um, we move further into this millennium. It's more important for students to be involved more than ever because it doesn't just stop at the federal level of voting for the president every four years. The real change that we want to seek in this country comes from being involved on the state level, being involved in the political process as a whole, and just being involved in general and knowing what's going on and voicing your opinions to your local legislators and your senators so that they know what we really want, what we stand for, and to actually make true uh, action change. Federal is important, but it only goes so far. The whole system is important, and that's why it's very important for students to be involved. And staff, all people should be involved. And so without further ado, please welcome Mr. Paul is this is going to be more of a conversation. And whereas earlier on I was um, um, talking about sort of social change in general, and if any folks are here and want to get copies of, or, or copies of the new editions, you have the old ones, some of you do, of uh, Soul or the Impossible, I slide my prices for poor students, underpaid faculty, you know, the gamut. So if you want to get one, just let me know what you can afford. And it's yours. Uh, you can email, check me in. Um, I take square. <laughs> Bring me up today. But what I want to do here is to talk about how do you create a climate at a school like this that encourages people. If you're in the back, come up, come up the front. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, a climate that encourages people to participate, including particularly in you know in elections. Um, one of the I mean, you know, I say, how do I spend my time now? Is it's not as a writer anymore. It's running this project called the Campus Selection Engagement Project. That's this national nonpartisan initiative that gets colleges and universities to use their resources to get school, get their students involved in elections at, at all at all levels. And and so that's that's my that's my dominant thrust. And, and that's sort of going to be the significant thing here kind of just looking at, at, at what it takes. So let, let me kind of give a little bit of an overview of some thoughts just in general, and then focus more on the elections and then, and then kind of open it up. So when I think of, I mean, I, I look at, it's interesting because I, I lecture all over the country. You know, I've you know, lectured at hundreds of schools. But this is a school that's like here in my own, you know, not quite backyard because I live in West Seattle, but pretty close to it. And uh, my oldest friend teaches at Pete Knudsen teaches Amthro here, and you know, I have other friends who teach So it's sort of like, instead of like foreign territory, it's like home territory. Mm -hmm. And you know, so I, and I know Washington politics because I live here in Seattle politics, et cetera, et cetera. So one thing that seems to be true universally is that students participate when they see models of engagement. Those models can come from lots of different places. So they can come from faculty. They can come from peers. They can come from you know, student leaders as such. You know, but they have to, you know, what I would say what a model is, is it's, it's, a, it's somebody in a particular context acting for social change. And then you can see, oh yeah, I guess I could do that too. So example, Pete's not, he came to one of the earlier sessions. But in Pete's anthro class, he'll periodically use a commercial fisherman environmental activist. And he'll talk about that. You know, at times, as you know, as something comes up, I'll just mention I'm going down to testify at a you know, public hearing, or he'll be on the radio or something. And none of his students are involved in the same issue as he is. 
and they have a lot of environmental issues, but they're not commercial fishermen. They're just, you know, it's a small, relatively small group of folks. And so it's not like they're going to replicate exactly his path. They're not. But all the time, I'm, I, we, we go running together and have for 35 years. And, you know, I'll be over and he'll like, pick up the sale time. He's like, oh, yeah, there's an ex student of mine working with this community group. And, oh, yeah, there's an ex student of mine working with this community group. And so you sort of see that the models that he's getting, that he's something that he's conveying to them, that he's, that he's not how to start it. One of the things that I, I talked about earlier is this trap we call the perfect standard, which is that you're, to be able to get involved, you have to know every single thing, every 17 decimal point statistic, have the answer to every question, be perfectly organized, perfectly eloquent, be the combination of King, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Superman, Wonder Woman, you know, throw everybody in the mix. You know, and none of us are. And so they see Pete coming in, you know, he's got his coffee cup, he's running like he's, you know, he's basically works two jobs and, and you know, fishing and gear, you know. And so they know he's not like the perfect human being who's on top of everything. But they also know that they see this person who's like, yeah, they're really, he's really passionate about this stuff and he cares about it and they can see that he's actually made some measurable impacts. And so I think that that has an impact on the students in, in his classes. And that's a reason that that so many of them end up participating. And again, it doesn't have to come from a faculty member. We were talking when I was sitting in a school in Florida uh, a week and a half ago, and I was asking people, I'll get into this a little bit later, why they voted. If they, if they didn't vote, why not? And if they did vote, and this is before, looking back to 14, the off-year elections, um, you know, why? And then people who voted, a bunch of it was, Somebody told me, you know, my, my best friend said, you know, I wasn't, I was too busy, but my best friend just said, look, this is really important, you've got to vote. My dad said, look, you know, this is important. Um, you know, in the African American community, you know, do you know what we went through in Florida to get the right to vote because they were not letting us vote. So, you know, I'm not, not going to hear you say, I'm not going to vote. Um, so, people essentially can gain models to each other that allow them to participate. And, and, and so, so that's, that's part of what I think most folks are missing. So I gave the, I'm not going to run down the whole story, but in kind of, in a kind of concise nutshell, one of the stories I always tell is, I tell the Rosa part because everyone thinks they know it. And the story that they know is, here's this lone woman, out of nowhere, just because her feet hurt, decided to move the, not, not to move the back of the bus, and on her own, just boom, changes everything. And the real story is, part of a community, part of the NAACP for a dozen years. She's the secretary. You know, she's doing the hard work of getting people to the meetings. Um, you know, there are other people in the community. There's a guy who's a union organizer named E.D. Nixon, who was the head of the NAACP in Montgomery, who got Martin Luther King involved. And he, you know, King didn't lead into involvement. He had all these excuses, because he was like, well, I'm too young, I'm too new in town. You know, and this guy just keeps after King until King finally participates. And all of that gets stripped away. Um, and so they lose the model of acting in community. And, uh, you know, and then what they, they lose the model of what I call intentionality. In fact, that Rosa Parks took training sessions and strategy sessions at a um, place called Highlander School in, in uh, Tennessee and met with earlier generation of civil rights activists. And so when she acted on that bus, she had to pick that data act but there had already been two young women from the youth section who had refused to move to the back of the bus. You know, so it was in the air. I, I have a friend who lives here whose grandfather, I think it was his grandfather, led a bus boycott in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, before the Montgomery boycott, like a couple years before. So it was like, um, you know, other people were trying to do this. And they knew they were going to launch a campaign. They didn't know it was going to win. They didn't know it was going to lose. But they're going to try. And they were being intentional. They were being strategic. And it doesn't mean you know everything. You don't know how it's all going to turn out for sure. But it does mean that you're saying, what do we want to accomplish? Here's our goal. How do we do it? You know, let's, you know, even something like what's like the $15 an hour, um, you know, wage thing. You know, let's try in a smaller place. Let's try in a place where they can't say we're just, you know, those airport industries in SeaTac. No, they can't just pick up and move because they're based at the airport. Therefore, you can buy, you know, and we know the airport makes money, and we know those businesses make money. So, 
you know, so let's try it here, see if we can make it happen, and then you try and move it to the bigger platform of Seattle. Um, you know, so all you know, in, in any kind of situation, you know, large or small, you know, you plan things out. You know, sometimes you take incremental steps, like you know, on the marijuana legalization. Then we go remember, but it was I don't know when it was maybe 10, 12 years ago, pushed through the city council to make it the lowest priority for enforcement for the police force. You know, which basically meant it was sort of quasi legal, but not completely. You know, Hasio the works. You know. Sky didn't fall, you know, it wasn't, you know, you know, it seemed like, you know, things were, you know, kind of proceeded as, as they were, but you had fewer people in jail, which was a good thing. And, um, you know, then let's try and roll it out on the state level. So all of that is being, you know, it's, it's being strategic. You know, it's what campaigns do. And, and the, the model for that is denied for students if they don't know the history. You know, and so when I, you know, and then the other part with Rosa Parks is, um, just perseverance, keeping on. The fact that she was going for 12 years, and if she'd gone, you know, given up in three years or five years or 10 years, we'd never have heard of her. So, you know, when I look at that story, most people, when I did show of hands, well, about half the people um, said, oh yeah, we did know the real story, and then somebody said, oh, but we read it in your book. And so I said, okay, put your hands down if you read it in my book, you know, before we read it before I said it. And then it was like about, you know, five people, which is what it usually is. And it's not that, you know, Rosa Parks was a long time ago, but so if people knew all these other stories of change, then I think that would be fine, but I actually don't think people do. So, you know, what it means is they're not having the models. And I remember I was talking to one student who said, really thoughtfully, he said, I said, well, what do you learn about any of these social movements in the past? And he said, to be honest, we don't learn very much. We learn that, we learn the conclusions, we don't learn the process. We learned that Lincoln freed the slaves, women got the vote, some unions were organized, Martin Luther King said, I have a dream. And it's like, we have no idea, and somebody signed a civil rights bill. Is it, we have no idea how any of that actually happened. <laughs> you know, we just know that it happened. But if we knew like what it was like to be part of it, and here are the setbacks, and here are the struggles, and here are the defeat, <clears throat> and here's how you keep on, and you know, we could really learn a lot from you know, but we don't know, it, so we don't get the chance to learn from it. So you know, so I would argue that the first, you know, the, the sort of the first order for a school is find ways to teach those social change movements so people know because they can. Again, it's not like it's always linear. Like you know, again, I think I go back to Pete. You know, he's talking about environmental fishing politics, and then somebody else. He's, or, you know, from his class, is organizing a Black Lives Matter, you know, march or, you know, something, you know, something working for the minimum wage. So it's not like it has to be the same issue because these models are transferable. You know, and if you learn how somebody acted in one situation for change, then you can figure out, okay, here's how we can do it in another context. I mean, it's the same way that you had, like, if you look at these, the sort of history of some of these movements, you had um, the you know, this abolitionist movement and slavery, you know, starting, you know, a lot of that happened started in England, you know, it jumps to the US, um, you know, then, you know, later on you've got, you know, you've got Gandhi in India being influenced by the writings of Henry David Thoreau about the abolition, about the abolitionist movement, you know, in the US, so Gandhi's over there, then the civil rights movement learns from, learns from Gandhi, then when they had the nonviolent revolutions in Eastern Europe, to overthrow the communist dictatorships, they learn from they learn from the civil rights movement, and you know, and it just you know the Arab Spring learns from from that. I mean, it just hops around, you know, internationally even, because you get a story of human courage and how to make change. That's transferable. You can learn those lessons, and you can take them, and you can apply them to something else in a very different context. So, so I think that's part of what we you know recognize is just the need to to try to teach that as much as possible because that then empowers people and then they can go, you know, and they can take it however they want to take it. You know. But they have to have those kinds of models and, and they don't by and large in the culture. Um, you know, even even the models of, you know, the organizing that happened, say at Central earlier on, like around the World Trade Organization where Central is probably the biggest hub. Um, 
people don't necessarily know that because well, you know it's a while ago, it's faded from memory, but you know it's stuff that happened here um, because this this has been a campus that has generated probably more activism since well since since how to start, since it expanded. I mean it was a really small school at one point, but say in the last 20 years when it's become a larger school, it's probably been the most active school in Seattle, like more even than UW, which has, you know, more students and has more money and more, you know, it has all these advantages. But somehow because people here are much closer to the hard realities because of economics and, you know, would be, you know, this is not serving the real work affluent populations. Um, this has been a, a place that's generated a lot of, a lot of good activity. Um, and so I think knowing that's important. You know, knowing that that, that you want to reach out to everybody. Um, you know, there's a tendency to think, okay, well, this engagement stuff is more like the sociology and social work folks and the poli sci folks, and that's kind of it. You know, if you have an anthropologist like me. Um, but I would argue that it should be for everybody, because everybody is affected by the choices that are being made. I mean, everyone is affected by climate change or, or will be. Everyone's affected by, you know, wage laws and, you know, who gets the subsidies and, you know, are we going to have decent affordable transportation? All that stuff affects everybody here. You know, and so sometimes it's more of a challenge, but I think it's, I know, I just think it's important. Um, I mean, I know that, um, um, you know, in, like, you know, this is an example is from a four-year school, but, you know, there was a student who was, um, now, he was you know, given to Barney, he was a wealthy, wealthy dad, and he was a doctor's son, father made a lot of money, and he's a Catholic school in Connecticut, and he came in saying things like, you know, I, I just, I want to be able to make enough money so I can say, here's my boat, my plane, my house, buddy, buzz off, don't bother me. You know, just like this, you know, I, I don't know, you know, not, I don't owe anybody anything, you know what owes me anything, I have no ties to the world. And, and, and that was sort of where he started, and just, you know, asking him, he was pretty racist in some ways. He was like, why are the blacks always complaining and we give them so much? I mean, he was just, he was insolent. He was just like in this little world, you know, and you know, people are. And then there was a professor who started talking about like environmental issues in his pre-med, he was gonna be pre-med, and you know, it was like, we're really annoyed. Like why, the purpose was to get us into medical school. Why is he like, you know, talking about this other stuff? And then he gets it. And he starts getting involved in these, these other issues. And his world opens up. And I remember when I talked with him last, he graduated. And he said, God, I can't believe I said those horrible things as a freshman. And I said, yeah, they're pretty bad. They're really bad. They're about as bad as it gets. He said, but you're not there anymore. Uh, I said, no, thank God, I'm not. But you know, if it weren't that this professor had taken this risk of talking about this stuff that maybe was a little bit outside the syllabus, I might still be there. He said, you know, thank God I've changed. So, so, you know, I think it's that sense that even people who may be a little resistant, you know, you kind of encourage them to be able to take a stand. You know, you, and you don't know who's going to be an influence. I mean, as I was telling earlier about how, you know, one of the things about social change movements is you don't know who's going to participate and where they're going to go in their lives. And I remember hearing there's a Nobel Peace Prize winner in Kenya named Wangari Maathai who was giving a talk. I can't remember if it was at SU or UW. You know, it was, so, you know, one, you know, one of the big venues in Seattle. And she was talking about how she'd go to this little Catholic school in the middle of Kansas, and that people were starting to talk about social <coughs> justice stuff, and she'd never thought about it much. And so she kind of, it really changed her, and she went back to Kenya. She ended up starting this thing called the Green Belt Movement, and they were planting trees, and then they got in conflict with the dictatorship, and you know, in and out of jail, and runs for parliament, and wins the Nobel Peace Prize. And basically, she was saying, if it wasn't for the stuff that happened at this little school in Kansas, in the middle of nowhere, you know, her whole path might not have ever happened. And that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, it's just like, yeah, you were there, you had this conversation, you got this person involved, they go to win the Nobel Peace Prize, you know, 35 years later or whatever it is, 40 years later. So I think knowing that is really important. Now, bring me into. <coughs> You know, so, so you want to create the models. Bring it to the, the, you know, the area that I'm working in now, which is the electro field. This is a really interesting time because 
you've got, particularly on the presidential level, you've got a whole lot of young voters excited, which is great. You also have a whole lot of young voters not voting for the person or people who are going to be the likely nominees of the parties. You know, so I would say, looking at it right now, there's a 95% chance that Hillary Clinton will be the Democratic nominee. And I don't know what, what odds you put on Trump. You know, probably better than even, but not quite as high, you know, 65, 70. And if you look at who young voters, say, under 30 have voted for, it is overwhelmingly not those two candidates. You know? And if you look who they would like in the polls, it is overwhelmingly not those two candidates. And if you look at who they trust, it's overwhelmingly not those two candidates. And every measure possible, um, I mean, the one that got me was this, um, was a veteran Republican bolster named Paul Frank Luntz, who did a poll called the Snapchat Generation of Young Voters. And one of his questions, he said that they were dangerously liberal, but you know, that, would be okay. that would be okay with me. But, you know. um, but he said that they, they asked him a list of 22 people they could go out to dinner with. And they could pick three. And they were like political figures and artistic, you know, like entertainment people. And so Barack Obama was the first choice. Jennifer Lawrence was the second. Ellen DeGeneres was their third. <laughs> the, you know, if they're like, good, that's a good, you know. <laughs> I like Hunger Games, and, you know, I like Jennifer Lawrence, so, you know. But, you know. Um, um, and Bill Gates was fourth. Bernie Sanders was fifth. You had to get to number 14, you got Donald Trump. And Hillary was tied with two others for 17, which means she only beat three people, you know. Um, there was a whole lot of people. I mean, and I, you know, it's like, yeah, you know, Kanye West, and, you know, and there was just, I can't even remember, Michelle Obama was in, the, you know, was in the mix, of course, and, you know, it's just like, what does this say? This says that people are not excited about this candidate. Because if they could have three, you know, they could go out, you know, they could have Barack and Michelle and Hillary, or Barack and Ellen DeGeneres and Hillary. Or throw the, I mean, you know, there's lots of combinations. They just weren't excited. And I've seen that, you know, saw a little bit earlier today. Saw, um, you know, school I was at in Florida, school I was at in Maine, school I was at in Ohio, school I was at in Michigan. I mean, there is this serious lack of excitement on the likely candidates. And so you can have a situation that's really precarious because people may not vote. I mean, you know, they're just saying, like, you know, I don't like any of this. And so, to me, and our project has, you know, is and has to be nonpartisan, but I want people to vote. And to me, one thing is absolutely clear. One of those two candidates for president is going to pick a Supreme Court justice, probably several, which is going to affect climate change, it's going to affect money in politics, it's going to affect immigration, it's going to affect Unions, it's going to affect everything. And that's just from the court, that's just from the cases that are now hitting a 4 4 court, you know, this year. You know, it's huge. You know, one person's going to have the power to escalate wars, de escalate wars. We you know, person power to who is going to be in charge of the Environmental Protection Agency. You know, I mean, all sorts of will Obamacare stay or go? All these things. And if people are like, well, you know, I don't like either of them. They're effectively, whichever one they're, they're effectively giving their vote to the candidate they like least. You know, whichever one it is. So you say, you know, assuming we're in a Trump delivery you can or say, you know, either way. And, and that's not a good outcome. You know, so I think part of the challenge then is, and, and I was working on a project before all these, you know, polls came in and, you know, uh, you know, because we knew there was a challenge of getting young voters out in general. But I think it's going to be much it's going to hit really hard this time. And, you know, there are other races. You know, our state has a senator's race. It has a governor's race, which might be very close. Yes. I mean, I, I told the story earlier. Canvassing is 2004. Um, I got, during the governor's race, of canvassing Ballard. I got three people to vote that day. One forgot it was an election. One needed a ride to the polls. And one needed uh, to do, figure out how to do an absentee ballot on election day. You know, so just you know, anybody walking the same blocks and ballot would have had the exact same responses. 
And then it turned out to be 134 votes. And I realized, uh, and my candidate you know, happened to win, uh, that had 50 fewer people volunteered, they all got three people like me, she would have lost. If 50 more had volunteered for the opponent, he would have won. So you know, either way, whichever you are, it was very clear to me that, you know, there's just this tiny margin. And stuff like that happens. We just, um, um, I ruled in Virginia, there was a 165 vote attorney general's race, which has been really important because the um, uh, one fifth of the African Americans have been disenfranchised from felony convictions, which is part of these laws that went in throughout the South um, as part of segregation. And now the attorney general and the governor are putting people back on the rolls. If you had had the different attorney general, they wouldn't have. You know, so really consequential, 165 votes. And you just don't know. So, so, you know, so part of the challenge, I think, is, is getting, conveying to people that it really can be close. You know, I live in the first district, council district, 39 votes. Of course, I happen to support Lisa Herbal. Chef, my friend Chef is a super volunteer for her. Um, you know, 39 votes. It's not that. You just don't know. So it's you know it's conveying that, but it's also conveying the sense, and this is this sort of this, getting back to this perfect standard, that if people say, you know, this isn't the perfect candidate, I don't really like them, that doesn't answer the question. The question is, one of these people will be president, governor, senator, etc. Which one would you prefer? That's the question. It's not, are they your ideal candidate? And I think conveying that is really important, and I think it's going to be a challenge. And somebody asked this great question um, last time, earlier today. He said, well, you know, what if you really want to sort of have more radical, fundamental change, and the candidates presented, you know, are not, you know, how do you deal with that? And I said, well, you know, you push, and you organize, and you, it's like a carpenter's toolbox. You got a hammer, a saw, a drill. You need all of them to build a house. You can't just say, I don't like that hammer, I'm throwing it away. I mean, if you could try and use your saw as a hammer, you're not going to get very far. So to me, what you do is you say, all right, you vote for, you know, these are the choices. And then you keep on pushing. You keep on working. You know, you keep on organizing to push those candidates in the direction that you want. Tea Party was very effective at that. Um, what everyone thinks now. Extremely effective. They got a lot of stuff happening because that's what they did. You know, they organized in the elections and they organized outside the elections. You contrast with Occupy, which really kind of melted away, partly because Occupy wasn't very electorally oriented. Um, you know, and had they combined the two, probably would have been much more powerful, but instead sort of melted away. And so, so I think part of the challenge in a campus like this is there will be a lot of people who consider themselves politically oriented, who consider themselves engaged, but who nonetheless stay away from electoral politics. I mean, my friend Pete asked his anthro class, and granted, you know, not every, you know, some people are international students, some people are undocumented, so they can't vote directly, although you can still volunteer, you can be, you know, you can be a translator for a community where they need translators to help, you know, get out and vote or registration ever. And there's lots of things you can do, even if you're not, you know, legally able to vote. Um, Paul, but, don't you think that, um, like, that's the question of the challenge facing the Bernie Sanders campaign right now, which yeah. is, how does he take all this energy, if he's not going to be the next president, right. how does he nonetheless turn it into uh, victories at uh, local and state levels right. throughout the country? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and that, and you've got to have that sort of grassroots, you know, mobilization. That's lar That's larger. I mean, one of the things that happened, you know, from my particular view, in the Obama campaign, is they had a huge amount of grassroots energy and a 13 million person lead email list. Nobody had ever had that much. You know, most of them were also quite small contributors, and they just kind of squandered it. You know, they didn't allow people or encourage people to organize on their own. They really hemmed them in. And so, you know, they weren't continuing to act, whereas the Tea Party folks, to their credit, they were, you know. And so I, I think that is going to be a challenge, you know, absolutely for the Sanders campaign to translate into something larger. And, 
But you know, for us here, the challenge then is how do you get people to participate in general? You know, and, and I think it is by getting people to think through, and we're going to have nonpartisan candidate guides for the president and for the governor of Washington. Um, we're not going to be able to have, probably not, although a political science class could create them using our templates for the congressional races, for the, you know, for the lower down races, which would be great, but we just, we're not going to be able to have the time to do that, or a sociology, or a communications class. I mean, that's something we're trying to get schools to do more of. But, you know, we're going to have a guide that says, you know, here are all the, you know, here's immigration politics, and, and health care, and, and uh, abortion, and climate change, renewable energy, you know, where we just go down and we contrast, and we've been doing this for several cycles, so we've gotten pretty good at it. And people like these guys, they're, you know, they, they think they're fair, they distribute them well. And so, you know, so, so part of the challenge here is, you know, uh, and, you know, and I'm open this up a few minutes. In a context where you know that there are significant numbers of students who are just likely not to participate, I was saying that Pete asked in his class, and about 10 or 15 percent of people said they were going to vote. This is last, last November when they, you know, the council races were happening. You know, that's not very much. It was just a fraction. And it was, you know, and most of them were potentially eligible. And he was just like, well, why not? And he was just like, well, you know, it doesn't matter what's one vote. You know, again, here's this 39 vote city council race. It does matter. It did matter. Um, but people don't think in those terms. So then the question is, uh, how do you, as an institution, because an institution, again, has to be neutral. The institution can't say, I like this governor's candidate, I like this senator's, I like this presidential candidate. The institution has to be neutral. Um, although the students in the institution don't have to be um, how do you get them to, to to act to foster? So I would say a couple of different things, and this is what we do. My, my friend Sh um, Shepard is going to sort of be our point person in some of the Seattle community colleges um, this fall, um, just to kind of convey our materials and kind of you know act as a coach and a guide to to sort of here's what we're doing, here's our resources, here's how to use them, um, and then you folks carry out the actual work. So you know, what I would say is that the you know, first thing is obviously we got to build a team, which I, you know, what I can tell, you folks are already in the process of making that happen, which is great, because you know, go back to the Rosa Parks story, you, know, you can't do it with a single individual, but you've got folks from student government, and you've got folks from service learning, and you've got folks from leadership, you know, in faculty, lots and lots can happen. You know, and, 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 you know, and then we, we break down and we sort of think, well, what can a school do? They can help people register. You know, it means getting the materials. One of the models we're trying to do is, in fact, we've got, yeah, we have online registration in the state. So one of the things that it's not too late to do is you can integrate it with classroom registration. So we had a school, not that many schools are just starting to do this, but it's doable, with, especially in states with online registration. And, you know, all it means is you basically, you know, most people register, when people register classes here, it's mostly online, right? Okay. So you're going along, and then you just, boom, this page comes up. Here is how to register, here's what you need, here's how to do it. We do have a link on how to register. You have a link, but you don't have where it just sort of stops. Okay, and it's not that far, I mean, so this one school in Florida, we're putting together different models, and they said it took us two years to get the permissions, and the IT folks did in 48 hours, you know? <laughs> the, the problem wasn't the technology. And this is a state that's probably made it as easy. You can even do it through Facebook now, that Sam Reed's office set up. So you know, we've had, in contrast to some states, we've had really participation support of secretaries of state office versus ones that are really trying to stop people, which is really ugly. And so, you know, so you know, to set that up, you know, and then you know, and to go into classes and to, you know, every place that people can think of. To get it, but I like the registration one, you know, with it, because you know everybody, everyone registers for classes. That's the definition. Of, you know, we have to do that to be a student. You know, and you know, and then you have it at the financial aid. And, you know, basically it's like here it is. You know, it's not that hard. This is what you need. These are the requirements. And then you do it, and then you move on. That's pretty effective. You know, but it's not. You know, then you then you you know beyond registering. You know, you've got to get people to convince them. To participate, you know. So there's educating on the issues. This is where, like, our candidate guides are at. You know, to distribute schools. Of, 
you know, they put them, blowing them up on there. They're, they're an eight and a half back to back sheet. So schools have, you know, printed them, they've emailed them out to everybody, they've blown them up onto posters. I mean, lots of ways to do it. But, you know, you can get, you, you may be really visible. So that people know, here it is. You know, maybe they'll know the presidential, maybe they won't think of the gubernatorial race, but that's the one that may, you know, in this state is probably likely to be the closest. Um, you know, so you see where the candidate stands are. Uh, and students have said, you know, if I just know where they stand, but I can't trust any of them, so therefore I don't know where they stand. And so this is coming through a, trust, a trustworthy source. I think that makes it really effective. Um, getting encouraging students to volunteer. You know, I mean, again, schools can't take a stand, but students can and should volunteer for the candidates they care about. And that's, you know, that's like my experience, or, you know, Chef volunteering in the Lisa Herbal campaign. Um, you know, it's, it can matter. You come down to a 39 vote council race, everything you do is a volunteer matters or a 134-vote governor's race. You know, and getting people to recognize that you know, it's a great way to multiply your power. And again, it's a way that you can participate even if you weren't, you know, say you're undocumented or say you're you know, international. There's still things you can do, you know, like being a translator for it. You know, a group that's registered in immigrant communities, you happen to speak the language. You know, you're not yourself eligible, but you, know, you can translate to somebody who is and help them participate. Um, and that fits really well with service learning stuff. You know, as long as the school can't say, you have to do it for this candidate, but just choose it. You know, the, so, you know, so there's the educating on the issues. There's, you know, when the debates happen, doing events around those debates, you know, to, you know, to do, I mean, it's, you know, hard because you're, you know, you've got day students, you've got evening students, but, you know, to somehow, you know, you can replay them and it's like, let's have some conversations. You know, we had, I mean, there's not, this school doesn't have a stadium, but, I mean, the school has that bad 1,300 people because they got they gave extra credit. Yeah. This Sunday is the King County Democrats in Renton, mm -hmm. and I don't know how many people who are planning to go. I'm going, um, so that you can make sure that the Democratic Party. You don't have to be a delegate. I thought you had to be a delegate. You, you, if you were involved in the, the caucuses, caucuses right. then you can Right, go. but not you can't go randomly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, so that does it. You know. So essentially, you know, and then you know, and then just on election as election day approaches, you know, and in our states as it's mail, you know, it's election weeks from when the ballots. You just be absolutely certain, you know, and you know, so people know here are the issues, here are the candidates. You know, um, you know, even stuff like, I mean, judges matter. And, you know, before things like the strangers started doing, you know, guys to judges, I would like call up lawyers I know, and like, I don't know who this judge is, who should I vote for? And I'm, you know, I'm super engaged, but it was just like I just didn't have that information. You know, now there's some resources that say, this, you know, this is why this judge is good, this is why this other one isn't, you know, and you, you make your own decisions, but at least that stuff's available. And, you know, and, and you know, what I sort of view it as is kind of, you, you, you make it as saliently as visible. And one of the things that, that people, when they study, like what helps voters' participation, it's the phrase of social norms. So, you know, if people think everybody else is really into this, then it feel, feeds on itself. If people think everybody else isn't into it, that feeds on itself as well. You know, and so you want to create a culture where it's like, this school is going to participate. And we're not telling people who to vote for. But we are saying that for all of us, we think it's really important. And it's coming at people from every single angle. That makes a real difference. So yeah, Chef, yeah. I just want to add some emphasis to your point. Well, you know, I think the presidential election is going to be important. I expect um, we're going to run it. And given what you were saying in the beginning, Paul, about the um, what do they call it? The unfavorables of, uh, right. of, of the candidates. candidates so yeah. That um, there's probably going to be a lot of people who are really feeling alienated and disenfranchised by the presidential election. But rather than trying to convince them the importance of that, though, I think about our governorship. But our state superintendent of schools is up. But for folks in Seattle. Um, it was probably going to elect a Democrat to go into Congress to replace Jim McDermott, and 
uh, that person, whoever gets elected, unless they really screw up, they're going to be there for a long time. Yeah, it's a it's a two year term, but um, once but, you get in, yeah. but once you're in at that seat, unless you really mess up, you're probably going to be there for many many years. Right. So that's a really important election where just if, I, I predict. It may be a close one, and just a few votes could make a big difference yeah. in who represents us in Congress. And we have a top two thing, so that means it'll be on the ballot in November, right? Yeah, I think it will. Yes. Yeah. So, so they, yeah, and that's hugely important. Yeah, I didn't even thought about that, but it is, you know, um, you know, so knowing about you know those candidates, um, you know, is, is really important. So I think I think multiplying. I mean. Part of what happens is, and this is, and again, I have not, I can't think of a presidential year where there was that much, maybe 1968, I couldn't vote at that point, but it was Nixon Humphrey, and, um, you know, where just Humphrey was the sort of flawed representative of the war and the vice president, and Nixon was this sort of, well, my view. Humphrey did not run a single primary, by the way. Yeah, yeah, see him. He was, after Robert Kennedy got shot, who would have probably been the Democratic nominee. I'm um, just sort of swept up. And it was just people, you know, people were really hostile towards that. And stayed home. That elected Nixon, who I might read, it's a pretty horrible thing. He's got a beach for some of them. Um, other legacies of his, like the Supreme Court justices, lasted 40 years. Um, and I think, you know, so conveying that, but, but conveying the range of up and down the balance, you know, and there may be, as you know, there may be people down ballot who people can get really excited about, you know. And it's like there's this. I mean, I have you know, my my personal choice, but you know, there's one of the candidates for Congress who I just think is amazing. And you know, I, I, the, you know, the day that um, she, yeah, well, okay, <laughs> yeah, she, <laughs> um, the day that that McDermott said he wasn't going to run, I texted her and said. God, or, you know, you'll be so good for this. Have you thought about it? Because a lot of other people are doing the same thing, you know. Um, and same person. Yeah. Um, I have a question since we have so many students here. Yeah. I would love to ask the student, what can we do to yeah. get you? Yeah. Yeah. Why don't you turn around? Good. And your peers. What would change your mind? What would get you engaged? I think that I always vote. Um. <laughs> what, but do you think, what, yeah. about, what about friends of yours who don't always vote? What do you think? I always vote. Mm. <laughs> I don't know. So, so there's no one, so you've pulled everyone in the universe. No, I mean, I don't. <laughs> no, 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 I don't mean the whole universe. I mean like your person, your person. But, I don't like personally convince them to do it. Yeah. I just Right, but, which is great. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Well, maybe I don't know. I, a broader question is, what would the students like us to do? See, yeah, period. I think it'd be awesome. Um, I know, you know, reporters are busy, and professors have a lot to teach in a short amount of time. But if me, at least one supporter of me, beginning of class before, Every teacher jumps into their subjects and stuff. I think it just do, I and mean, maybe as uh, we work together on creating some sort of template document, right. getting the professors to just take up five minutes out of their classroom time and talk about how important it is to vote in a very nonpartisan way, right. and just how we all can make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I feel like that students don't feel like their voice matters, it won't matter, or that they can't make a difference, or they don't know how. Or they don't even know the beginning of the process of politics. Just politics is confusing, but it's not. I mean, it is what it is. Once you get into it, you start to understand. You're like, oh, okay. And I feel like a lot of students today don't understand the process, don't understand the three you know levels of government, they don't understand any of that, and so they're just scared off of it. And if we could just introduce students in classrooms, not just political science students, I know, just yeah, they have the campus political science. Just, just jumping off kind of like what you said with the student who was in med school. Like, oh, it's a waste of my time. But by the end of it, he said it changed my life. Yeah, you know? yeah. 
And we have more. He's an undergrad chemistry class, you know, on track to med school, and then you know, we've got this all down. Yeah. I'd like to. Oh, go ahead. Uh, just, just oh. that. If we could just incorporate that as a, as a fundamental stone, and you know, and to the faculty to say, hey, faculty, you know, it's really important for students to be involved, and a lot could change. If this whole Cap College had students who were engaged, that is a lot of people. So a lot of that could make a difference. And they only have to be registered to vote, like like uh, Ms. Mr. Paul Lowe said, the ones that can't can just help to volunteer and get that engagement going. That's like seven to eight, eight to fourteen thousand students if every single one or if every other one got involved and then they inspired three people. Yeah. You can see how that multiplies yeah. to pretty much the whole city then of Seattle. Right. And people are also involved in the communities. Yeah. yeah. I like I, I like the idea and the argument offer lots of activities, but I like what you're suggesting, um, specifically about the professors in the classrooms, and I think we should create something. One of the, you know, one of the templates that actually is a good one that does exist is um, National Voter Registry. When, when, I can't remember, when do folks start? You start the end of September, the very last. Oh, we, like we have like a week before the deadline, before the, before the fall. Okay. We can do stuff in spring. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's really important to, do, to be doing that. Because I was going to say National Voter Registration Day, but that's September 17th. So you're not even started yet. I mean, that, yeah, that calendar of yours is, um, boy, that makes it, it really puts a premium on spring. And I would say that it puts a super premium on integrating the classroom registration stuff. Because that's the point. Otherwise, you know, so you're only like a week or so before the cutoff. So I think two things then what I would say is one is all that pre stuff like the classroom and then it has to be first week in class because it's going on after another week, it's too late. So I think, you know, and, you know, and just say, you know, this is it. Faculty wide, you know, you know, normally, you know, normally we would, you know, if we would start earlier, we would do this, you know, a ways in. We don't have this latitude. This is the chance, you know, it's like use it or lose it. So I think you should do it before the end of the quarter. You should do it, yeah, you should do right. it in Because you, you also have two different streets. You got a, you know, a stream of people going out, you got a street. You got a stream going out, a stream continuing, and a stream coming in. You want to get all three of those. And, and I think you could do it like beginning of the quarter, maybe somewhere in the middle, again, just right. hammer it in, and again at the end, you know, just repetition, repetition. Then if you think about it, if students who are off put by it, or in the beginning of the quarter, eh, midway to the quarter, eh, by the quarter, eh, but then they go to their next class, and again the professor is right. saying, are you registered to vote? Are right. you doing this? Eventually they're going to be like, you know what? Yeah, well that was like, the, it was like the student in Florida who said, like, yeah, my dad bugged me so much. You know, I was just like, I wasn't going to, no, 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 no. He just bugged me so much. Finally, I was like, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, I'd like to just throw out one thing, just in, I was going to say something. Oh, okay. Just something that I keeps coming to my mind is you know, something, one way to really reach the students on this campus is housing. You know how expensive it is in Seattle. And I voted for John Grant, and he's young and energetic and all that. He didn't win, but um, you know he's going to run again because he knows about the housing issues and you know, he's from the ground up. And wait, that's not where I was going with this. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, because what I learned through listening to him, I had a house meeting. What I learned from listening to him was that basically counts our city council members create sweetheart deals with the wealthy builders in this community. They're not building things that are good for the community. They're building things that are good for people's pockets. And, um, and so it's really the council members we should be holding accountable. And so if students can understand that the reason they can't afford housing around this campus is because of city council actions, then you know it's really local. We have to help them see that it is so important to vote because it's real local right. stuff. Well, would, 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 uh, I'm sorry. That's it, there and then there. Or, or there. Sure. there, there, and then there. I think it's important to like hold discussions to tell students how important their word actually is because we're taught our whole life not to think for ourselves yeah. things are the way that they are and not to make change. And then, like the power of social media is like so ridiculously powerful that you see all through social media, you know, who cares if you vote, it don't matter. And if we actually hold these discussions on why they matter and what impacts they have, like students might actually think, oh, maybe my voice does matter. Because I think a lot of us are so powerless. Mm -hmm. And I think the, you know, the, because of so, I mean, I'm struggling. 
I, I don't claim to understand social media as well as I'd like. You know, but, you know what, I, what I feel like is it doesn't replace face-to-face -face conversations, but it can sure amplify exactly. it. So, you know, so if you're having face-to-face -face conversations, you're having conversations on the ground, then it means that every student, you know, their community is that much bigger mm -hmm. because it's all these other people that they're connected with. And, and so it's, it's another way that the more people you galvanize here, it's going to ripple out beyond just central. I was just going to jump on what you said. We had, I don't know if it was last quarter or the quarter before, but we had the council members that were running come to our school and talk to us. We, the students were allowed to ask questions, and I felt we had a really good turnout for that. So mm -hmm. it was, yeah. and that's it was what successful I was, that. I was going to ask is mm -hmm. if candidate forums would be popular on this campus. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, and so I'm thinking of that congressional seat. Those candidates are oh, already yeah. campaigning. So they probably jump at a chance to come have a forum here before the school year ended. Yeah, absolutely. The primaries in August. The primaries in August. The primaries in August. But I think they put something in the final two candidates. Yeah, but the final two candidates, that was something that we could set up. You want well, you don't have, we don't know who the final two are. So we will in August. No, I'm saying, but who's here in August? Not very many people. That's my point. So my point, my, what I'm trying to say is that there's five candidates, and all five of them here in, in June. Yeah. Oh. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. And, and, get people, yeah. and then you get people yeah. registered. And then, the, and, then the, yeah, and then you hit the two, you know, and then you get yeah, the two. Yeah, and then come back for the two. The yeah. two in October. Yeah, if you could do a double header with that, that would make lots of sense, I think. Um, if you yeah. think people would come to that. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and it is, you know, and again, I think it's like, I mean, using, because, you know, the phrase I hear is, people say, my vote doesn't matter, and they, and, they, and they mean it on two levels. They mean it on, what's one vote? And I think that one, you know, the answer to that is like, well, it's 134 votes for the governor of Washington, it's 39 for our council, it's 165 for the attorney general, it's 550 for George Bush in Florida, you know, it's like, it's often not that many, you know, the Senate race, you know, 334 votes where an Al Franken won, and then, you know, the guy, they were counting the ballots, and somebody put Al Franken and then lizard people on the ballot, right. and the lizard person, lizard people person didn't count, they didn't get counted because they said, we don't know if he's voted for Franken or, or lizard people. I say he, but I, you know it's a guy, you know. Um, you know, you don't know if he's voting for Frank and Melissa people. Yeah, so that's the other thing. Yeah, I just wanted to also say that I think about, like, another way to inspire students to get more involved in the political process is to give examples of what happens, or the results of, because everybody knows that one of the least voting demographics is young people. When you can look at problems that impact <coughs> young people, really students, yeah. and I brought the charts, I mean, students constantly complain that textbooks are too high. Yeah. It's yeah. basically like a scam. They gouge it out, and they have these, like, codes, and they have to buy it again and again and again. And I strongly feel that if a company was doing that to any other demographic, there would be instant laws to change that, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if every year you had to buy a new code to have your car work again, that wouldn't work, you know? Yeah. But, and then you have things like, you know, like students trying to ride the bus, or, you know, always little, like, always little issues that people that, you know, aren't students that have jobs and stuff, that's not an issue they care about, so they're not voting on these issues. And as a result of not million people voting collectively, students <coughs> oftentimes want to not get really bad deals yeah. In the general thing. Yeah. So I think this really kind of like laying out like this is the result of not what's going to happen if you don't vote, but this is what's happening because you're not voting right. currently. And then I think and again the you know the the sense that you just you know you don't know from out here how close this stuff's gonna be now. You know. And that it really you know, it really could be this handful of votes. And you know, and has been. And I think it's really important to stress. And then, you know, and then, you know, when they say that my vote doesn't matter because, you know, the same, you know, corrupt people are going to still be in power, then the answer is, you know, is basically, yeah, you've got to do these other things too. But who is in power is going to matter a lot, yeah. Um, yeah, just kind of jumping off of what the point that he's made and then what uh, Max made is that, yeah, we need the issue that said, neutral bipartisanship in the classroom. We need to bring up examples of what has happened because people don't vote, or examples of what happened because people did vote, right. you know, and how your voice does matter. Yeah. And 
that needs to be hammered in at least four, at least I think three times would be amazing if we can get that in the quarter and then again uh, repetition over years. That's gonna like people are just gonna get mad and just be like, I don't want to hear something when we do it. And also you hark it back to like the 1800s, 1900s, and how we changed society where the political process was a big thing. And maybe it's because there right. wasn't much to do, right? Or maybe so much, much, but it's still just as important. Yeah. And uh, we need to not be blinded by that our voices do matter and these decisions that that these people make in these offices affect all of us every day on a daily basis. And so our voices need to be heard and uh, people need to be more inspired to be part of that political process. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the other thing that's true in terms of the states is that when people start to vote young, they tend to continue. So that's like when you get people, it's worth the you know, when you get people now, they're gonna be more likely, you know, there'll be like two curves. And generally participation increases with age, but the curve of the people who participate in young is gonna be ahead of the curve of the people who did. Let's see there. Um, so a while back they had booths out front to vote, um, and when I saw that, I was really happy. I don't know if that's on part of Seattle Central that asks these people to come, or if those people just knew that this is a good place for a lot of people. Um, so it's not only in classrooms telling people to go register, right. but it's making it available to them. Yeah. Even though it's available online, they have to choose and go over. Right. Oh, yeah. And you want to hit people from multiple, you know, like you hit them from multiple angles. Mm -hmm. So they may be, okay, I didn't do this one. But then the next day, you know, here it is, and the next day, I mean, I have this completely different context, but um, years ago, I was interviewing somebody who was active on sort of yeah, uh, the environmental impact of this huge nuclear complex in South Carolina. And, you know, he was basically, some, he, was, he was a farmer with cucumbers, and somebody came by to get like you know, five truckloads, and the guy said, oh, you know, we were talking, you know, talking to this young man about, you know, the nuclear. He said, oh, you're on your nuclear thing again. And he sort of thought, well, he's heard it once. He's not going to hear from this guy. But then if his minister started raising it, then, you know, or his neighbor, then that first, that first one would have made the difference. So I think it's like, it's hitting people from multiple angles, yeah. I think, you know, institutionally, it's really incumbent upon us as faculty, I think, and the students. Um, the faculty really needs to start this to get the administration on board. Mm -hmm. um, because we have a turnover in the administration. We've had an right. administration that's been lacking in commitment to this kind of thing for a long time. And I think in terms of modeling, it really needs to come from the top. And so I think we really need to make an effort to do that. Yeah. And I guess, you know, this is the my, my organizer hat on, but, you know, schools have different power to school, power to school divides in different places. Mm -hmm. Clearly the president has. I mean, Miami Dade is this great example. The president is totally committed to civic engagement. Lots of stuff happens. You know, hires people who are really great. Boom, this occurs. Right. You know, sometimes you have the opposite, which I would argue that in fact you've had here at Central. You've had both. You've yeah. had you know different deans who are like really great at building a commitment and then just trying. And this is my particular bias, but it's, you know, no one goes a teacher. You know, then you've got people who are just like hostile. You know, shut down student government or limit student government, shut down the newspaper. You know, take away the voices that people have versus promoting. And so how do you, you know, how do you sort of shift that? You know, you shift it part by organizing. I mean, the dean who finally got pushed out by faculty and students, people had to organize and did and succeeded, although it wasn't easy. Um, and so, you know, I think that the more power, and you, you're kind of in a flux period, you know, the chancellor, the, because I mean, all this stuff's kind of up for grabs. So the, the more people organize, you say, well, you know, we have what, you know, we have a team, we've got faculty on board, we've got student leaders. You know, you you're basically demonstrating power. And then somebody comes in who actually has, you know, some a greater degree of formal power, and they're they're like, they have a choice. They can try and go against that, mm -hmm. or they can say, oh, okay, well, you know, this isn't a bad thing to do. It's probably beneficial to the school if more students vote, because the voice will be heard. Yeah, let's have let them do it. So I think. You know, part of the challenge in every school is different, and I, you know, I probably know more of the, I do, you know, the inside, you know, stuff and the dirty laundry here than I do at most schools, just because I live here and I've got friends who teach here. Um, but what I do know, and that's universally true, 
is the more you build power in that sort of coalition to make something happen, then, you know, then the person who may not be wanting to lead the way, who's at the very, very top, sort of like, well, okay, I'm not going to fight on this one. You know, or somebody who's, you know, who's, who really wants to do the right thing will say, okay, you know, I would, my initial impulse would be too complicated, but I guess it's already organized for me. So great, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back this. You know, that was sort of like the, you know, why I talked to some of us earlier, we've got this young woman who organized the sustainability coalition at the school in Virginia. And, you know, when this group was tiny, the president wouldn't meet with them. When they were big, he did and ended up backing them. Yeah. When someone just spoke about instructors and talked about voting and how important it is, I think that when um, discussions like this come up, those also need to be put in classrooms and just make them available to students. Because today it was the first day that I saw a sign for this. Right. And I read them incorrectly and thought that I missed it today. And then I walked by this classroom oh. and saw you guys. But had I been introduced to this information in class, I would know what I was doing. Yeah. 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 We're going to circulate my email list if you want to be on that. And, you know, yeah. Somebody got it earlier, yeah. I just like to mention really quick that also like uh, like political organizing is really important. The state has a biennium budget and next year coming up is the time to make the budget. I remember the first time I ever went down to Olympia to like lobby was the same time that there was the Occupy Seattle down in South Lawn. Make buses for people. Right. We went down there and this big thing. They were, you know, and in that same year they had said that I was on the college council and they had told us to prepare for like five or six percent cuts across the board. Wow. And then we like ended up doing no cuts at all. And I like to think part of it was because we like filled up, like they literally like have to have the Washington State police come out and blockade all of the entrances because there's so many people there. Wow. And then all the and then like the next it's like, like next year's or whatever, we went and there's like literally like a tenth of the people. And of course, I have not seen there's a like connection between that. And I think that uh, you know, students and faculty and staff and administrators are all in the same boat in terms of decisions and like legislator things. Yeah. And to me, it doesn't make sense. Like, yeah, we had a bunch of people and, we, and, then, and, then, and then we won. The next time we didn't say any people you know, and we lost. And that makes yeah. such a, I mean, I remember this is going back a ways, but this is. I remember like in 1992, I was volunteering, because I was volunteering on election day, and I was, they said, you know, go down this precinct. I don't know where, it was south the federal way, and, you know, there were like five volunteers for that precinct, and, you know, and, and which meant that there were clearly that many volunteers all the way kind of in towards Seattle from there. And then the next year was one of the, it was the really, my view, really bad Tim Iman initiative. And I was, no one would volunteer. And I was volunteering like on Capitol Hill. And there was like three people showing up. And it was just like, what is going on? No one is volunteering. And I was just like, this is really bad. Of course, the initiative passed. And you know, the turnout was dismal. And it just makes such a difference. So it's coming up again. There'll be another budget here this year. Yeah. As always, you know, impacting the state. So we could stand to lose a lot. And that's what we said. It's consistent. And how it's framed to people to make it tied up out of that. You know, and that you don't make something feel like it affects them. Right. So yeah. it doesn't matter how many things you said it must and, and, and that's the that wish challenge. Is yeah. It's this personal. Everything always gets framed as if it's a top down thing.
some of the people that I know that don't, that are kind of disillusioned with voting, they actually still vote, but they're not, they don't take the time to like investigate them. So it's like they're, you know, the voting ballot. Then if, if they'll read the thing, luckily Washington State's is a little bit more informative than, than other places right. as far as like providing information in, in as semi-objective way. But it's still kind of one of those things that's like, you know, granted the night before and yeah. yeah. One of the things that, uh, I don't, we're not necessarily the brainstorming stage, but I'm going to throw this out because I didn't break paper and pen today, so I won't remember this. Um, um, when we're talking about things that we can do on campus, you know, forums, I, I think are a great idea. But also, I love what student leadership did around, um, was it MLK Day, I think? Yeah, that stuff's still up there. So yeah. That yeah. stuff was, I kept reading that. And so what did you guys do? Oh, they had. We did a, um, a we, like, I contacted out a former student of ours, uh, alumni, to do uh, MLK's entire life. Or like the main the main points oh, in his life, cool. but all done in the, in the motif of a different African American artist, starting with his birth and then his like education, and then like the heavy years between like sixty five and early sixty four and sixty six, right. including his death. So it was like a kind of like a we walked through. Yeah. Oh, that's so cool. It was fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I think we could do stuff something like that oh, right in the main hallway about you know. Why can't you afford to live, you know, near the college? Yeah. And, uh, you know, all the issues. Why are your books so expensive? You know, the things that will grab students' attention about the election. Well, I think we really think people understand what's going on. A what? The book thing, if people understand yeah. Yeah, yeah. that it's like a whole yeah. scam. It's crazy. So just something I'd like you to do. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> What, what do folks think, I mean, in terms of the specific culture here, um, in terms of the barriers? What do you, you know, where, what do you think hangs people up the most about where the first people don't go, just from, you know, people you know? A lot of people I know basically feel like the system is too corrupt to be right. reformed and that by voting in, you're just encouraging it. Dysfunctional moral system. Yeah. yeah. It's a moral dilemma to vote at all, rather than just, if anything, country on it. And, you know, and I think that that's like, and that has echoes elsewhere, but I think it is really stronger here. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just, it, it's, so you have this school that's more activist, you know, more off the charts left, and then I'm not going to vote. And and I think it's it's to my mind it comes from a sort of again I go back to the sort of purism stuff that it's sort of a confusion of politics as maybe expressing who you are, which it can't is a part of it, but also politics as dealing with power and trying to get power for what you want to achieve. And I think people, they see the first, but they don't see that second. And so the idea that somehow I will be, because I, I have seen that at other schools, but I think it probably is also more concentrated here, where you'll have people who are social activists who don't know. Uh, and you know, to me, the antidote is to say, there are going to be consequential decisions made by people who are elected, and you are basically empowering by not participating in a lot of politics as organized people versus organized money, you're empowering organized money. You're empowering the people who you like least who are going to be pumping billions of dollars into these campaigns by not participating. And, and, and you're still going to, that's not going to, your withholding is not going to, all it's going to do is empower the person you like least. But, you know, if you do act, you can, you know, you can change things, but you're probably going to have more luck with somebody who's more sympathetic than less sympathetic towards what you want. You know, so I, mean, I just look at something like the Obama. You know, you look at the administration, you look at the, the stuff on gay rights, you look at the Dream Act stuff, you look at Keystone. You know, there's, a, there's a bunch of areas where Obama 
absolutely did not lead on. And one might say he should have. But when people pressured him, and then he did do things that at least, you know, I personally, and some other people say, yeah, those are good things to do. Um, and, you know, because of that pressure, but probably had, a, you know, had his opponent been in there, would have been more resistant to the pressure because he just, you know, he was further away from those issues. Yeah. You know? I think, well, I think like even deeper than just like, do you like, are you politically active, right? So yeah. like, change nation, do you vote? I think it's even bigger than that. I think there's this kind of, I think like the, one of the problems with the left is almost like, it's almost like they're too educated and too diverse and people just, you know, like, what do they say, like, the firing squad of the, of the left is people yeah. in the circles. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's just basically what it is. And I think, like, like, at least in my experience with, you know, activism and organizing is that no matter what it is, no matter if you're trying to convince me to vote or not, or, or convince me to go into March, you have to basically, like, keep that peace and have what they call a lot of diversity of tactics. You have to allow people to, to do their thing and still allow them to do your thing and not alienate and be like, what do you do vote? And then you're like, yeah. not, you're not <laughs> Party, uh, like in in trying to caucus this year, uh, um, uh, you know, you have to sign this agreement. Like, I swear I am a Democrat uh, before <laughs> I can go actually like yeah. decide who I want to. Right. You know, and it's like the party itself actually, the like Democratic Party, requires that you do that. So in in some ways, that is kind of like modeled. Uh, that that might be the purest mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm torn on it because in the sense that. You know, it's sort of like if it is an organization, then the organization should have. I mean, I can't remember. There was, there was this. I think it was an Eagles club over in Ballard, and there was like a health club that was trying to buy it, and so they had all the people sign up at the Eagles club to like so that they could vote to sell it to the health club. You know, I don't even remember that story. It was like a couple months ago, and I was like, yeah, that sounds really sleazy to me. So I think there is a certain logic to sort of saying, if you're an organization, you have a right to be able to say, you know, you support, you know, if you're going to be making decisions, if you support it. I'm sort of torn on it because I, I can see the logic on both sides. Mm -hmm. I think what's kind of happens here is like the city's so left sometimes that people are like, well, it's already left. They're just going to make these decisions. Like right. even if even all my friends voted, it's like you know, like I mean, like one of the examples is like voting for Mike McGinn or Ed Murray. I was like.
keep in mind when we talk about you know people not wanting to vote. I mean that's part of you know the whole Bernie thing, you know idealism thing around Bernie. But but I think we have to keep in mind that young people are incredibly idealistic, and I mean I took pretty hard line stances about politics when I was in college, and so we have to find ways to get them to see the gray areas, not you know this whole business about you know you you, you got to vote for somebody and then you mm -hmm. know work for change and all that. Um, yeah, um, I was going to say something else about that. Um, about that. You know, I was just going to ask, my students are doing a service learning project and they're going to do voter registration um, here at the very beginning of June. And one of the things they're planning and they're working um, with Belmont on is education, not just having tables just to register people, but education on the kind of things you're talking about. What does it mean if you don't vote? Like, you know, what are, you know, yeah. having those comparisons, what do these candidates look like? Um, so that there's education as well as opportunities to register. And I'm just wondering about the students that are here. Is that attractive to you? Yeah. Because, like, I'm interested in voting all the time, but I know so many people that are just like, mm -hmm. and, like, I feel like if students knew, like, how large our number actually is. Right. Like, they're so set off by the thought of baby boomers and all that stuff, and I'm just like, well, there's actually a lot of us, too. Like, and it just right. flipped, I think. I think it just flipped for the balance. I think it was different. Yeah, but well, you all are larger than I think the millennials are, are, are larger than Generation X and baby boomers. Yeah, so right. sure. and a lot of students don't know that. And some baby boomers can't lift the stamps anymore, so. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, okay. This is really important. Yes, there is. There is. Yeah. There was no good. So the data. So so there is in case basically there's a thing called NSAL, National Survey of Student Learning, blah blah blah. blah. What it what it does is it matches two databases, and there's a master database of everybody who registers for college, and there's a database, a voter file database, and if a school signs up for it, you will get the data on what percentage of people are registered and what percentage turn out. Okay. And, and it's free. It's, free. it's grant funded. Um, it's up. So if you go to, if you um, national, so if you put in NSAL and circle. NSLV? Yeah, NSAL and circle. I see that here. Um, there's a form to fill out. It has to be filled out by somebody at, like, dean, vice president, um, registrar, kind of, you know, senior minister or, or higher. Yeah. Um, and I'm just going to see and sell. And it's the letter N? I, I just, N is advanced, it sounds like. M-S-L-V. Okay, yeah, here it is. Okay, so... It's a national, and this, 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 this is the site. So, so and, and the deadline, if you want to get your 2012 data, is May 13th. Because they kind of batch run it, and they're like overstaffed and stuff like that. But it's free, you know, all it takes, and there's a form on the site, and there's a signature. And, and if you've seen my, our seven key ways document, there's a link in there um, to go to it. And so basically, and then it's the schools, so the, none of the, I'm sorry, all the data is anonymized, so that like it doesn't tell you this student is registered or this student voted. It just gives you the aggregate stuff. But it also breaks it down by discipline uh, because that's part of the registration stuff. And the school then decides whether, how public to make it, like whether to share it with just a tiny group, you know, to share it with the voter engagement team, to share it, you know, make it public. Uh, you know, it's but it's totally the school's discretion. And you know, and and basically, you know, it's possible that you're signed up, it's, but it's also, I mean, there's 900 schools at this point, um, but it's also possible that you aren't, and I'd say I'd say probably maybe 50/50. So, but if you go and you fill out the, you basically just fill out the form, and 
you know, you fill out the form requesting the report, and that will immediately tell you either you this is the person who has it, or you're not signed up. Here's how you sign up. And you know, and I would do it before May 13th because then you can get to 2012. My computer broke down this afternoon. Hopefully, and I don't work tomorrow. Hopefully, on Monday before I meet with the president of our college. Oh, right. I, okay, send me an email. Hopefully, I'll get into my email. Yeah. Send me an email. How do you mean? Uh, nine or nine. Okay. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so it's run out of cir circles, this research is out of time. Um And it's just, and again, it's reached a tipping point where, you know, when they were only having a few hundred schools a year. And the school doesn't even have to, people don't even have to, they didn't release the names of the schools participating because they were really trying to, like, okay, we won't even tell, just sign up, just do the data. But now that there's 900 schools, it's, it's flipping. So that now it's the norm, you know, it's becoming the norm of schools to participate in it. But it's really great. And there's just no reason not to sign up because you got the data. It's free. All it, literally all it takes is a signature. What and percentage of uh, students on this campus are um, not eligible to vote? No. You got a really high international. Well, but we also have high percentage of students that have been incarcerated that are not eligible, right. and that's like that's a whole other system. What, so what's, now Washington's rules are, I think, they've changed. They They're better. trying to change. They're trying to change. Trying to change. But we have a very high percentage of students that can't vote. Wow. So either by cause, reason of felony conviction, mm -hmm. or uh, they're not citizens yet. Right. So and one of the five students here. So on the felony one, mm -hmm. is it a time clock or is it a restitution now? Like like so you're talking about the international student. Time, I think. Because the one thing I would definitely, if you've got a high percentage of those, I would make a concerted campaign to, like I remember, like, I was canvassing Angular Long again, but, you know, and some guy said, you know, it was this like seriously scary guy with these big chains on his arm tattoo. <laughs> but, you know, he said, oh, well, you know, I'm a felon, I can't vote. I said, you know, you're on this, you're on this list. That means you know that you're you know you, whatever it is your rights have gotten restored, mm -hmm. or you wouldn't be on this list. And he's like, great, I, I will vote. And you know I would make if you have a high percentage, I would make a concerted effort to figure out exactly okay, this is the information on how you get your vote back, mm -hmm. when, what it is, because you know if there's say I don't know two thousand students, I'm just picking them around half, you know two thousand students. From you know who, who haven't been able to know it, maybe 500 of them actually can, but they have to do X, Y, Z. And if you you know and if you folks take responsibility for the X, Y, Z, you know you can just do the information for the posters, with you know you know just you know or a small campus email or something. That would really right. you know, if it's significant, that would be really important. Well, you know, just on an individual level, I give students the information on expungement because a lot of them. Charges. Right. Right. Um, expungement. I've given them the information, and it would be a good campus by campaign. Right. That's to, what I'm saying. To restore yeah. voting rights yeah. to felons and that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think there's a certain number of steps that we could do. You know, that we could yeah. restore voting I mean, and we rights. like one of our schools, Virginia Commonwealth, actually partnered with a some of the students partnered with the tenants union of the public housing project. Mm -hmm. We have and we have that up on our website, like how to do it. Um, and they, they help register people, help felons restore their rights. You know, it's like, there's the rules, you got rights to the polls, yeah. Um, I just want to back that because uh, my younger brother got in trouble as a kid, and so he had to go through expungement. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't so much the length of the process it was, it was that why do I even want that right back? Oh. Voting, why does it matter? Mm -hmm. right. So if we encourage and uh, educate people so it does matter, Right. Yeah. Um, they'd be more likely to go through that process. Yeah. Right. And we've got help in the city for this Yeah. Really See, a lot of times people, like, like one of the things we spend a lot of energy doing is navigating people through terrible voting laws. Because most of the states we're working in, like Virginia and Ohio and Florida have terrible, and North Carolina and Wisconsin have. But we're in all the states with the worst voting laws. Um, and some of the deep south states. But here it's something slightly, you know, it's different. And it's something that is remediable, but people may not know. I mean, you know, there's a sort of assumption that everybody 
operates in this world where they know everything. You know, they're just like, oh yeah, I knew about that. This is how I get my rights back. People don't know that stuff. You know, so it's like if you really make a targeted effort to get those folks, then you know, like, oh, I didn't realize it was that straightforward. I thought it was harder. Than that. So I think that's really important. Yeah. Especially when you're talking about reasons why people don't vote. I mean, I was when I was a student here, I was really involved in a bunch of stuff. It's hard to tell that uh, they were one time at a band smoking on campus. I'm a smoker, and I'm like, that's not only like irrational, it's going to be a bad idea. It's like, you know, it's really a bad idea for all these reasons. Like, I really don't want to do that. So I started at a club called the Smokers Union. Huh. And I was going around gathering petitions to get students to get students to sign on, so they didn't want to get to be smoke free. So I just walk up. It should be easy. You walk up to students that are smoking and then the sign. I walk up to people and explain, like, hey, like, we're smoking a cigarette, you're going to dance, we're on campus, would you sign this petition? You're going to stop, you're like, no. But you smoke here, and if you do this, they're going to find you, like, $100. Like, I don't care, get away from me. And I'll be like, maybe you don't understand, maybe I should rephrase this, like, I'm trying to help you out, like, right. saving money, and allowing you to do what you're currently doing right. right now. And they still be like, you're not understanding me, walk away, like, I'm not doing it. And I'd be like, and then as level, I was like, wow, like, I didn't really understand, it. like, no matter what, like, you could be like, you want, you know, Dollars, you know, some people are just not going to do it. It's right. like really insane. Yeah. And it's really like I would experience for me. You know, uh, yeah. And, and I, you know, people are sort of just bought into the in this society to kind of leave you, you know, being yeah. alone without a recognition that all this stuff is affecting people. Yeah. Right. So that happens too. So I wouldn't get too discouraged if you're not able to get 10 or 10 people right. on your list of votes. Right. You get as many as you can. Yeah. Yeah. Just mm -hmm. And I think, again, it's the challenge is getting all the faculty. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. here are these, but get all of them. It's like, all your students ready, they all should be participating, everyone who can, you know, and here are these other ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Any other last thoughts? This has been fun. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a great day. Yeah. That's what I'd say, like, being voters are really important. I mean, just talking about getting those numbers from kind of states registered. I think that even if there's an elected official that you didn't vote for, you don't even, you don't even like that, you're here to come to their office and, you know, it's like, here's the deal. I have this many people voting, which if you do the math and you want to keep this job, it pays well. And you don't do what all of us say, you're not going to have this job. So I think even if you don't, even if you, you know, you can just do that kind of posture and strengthen numbers kind of thing. Well, that's it. I mean, you know, that it's you know, it's some of it's convincing, and some of it's um, power. Yeah. It's building power. Yeah. yeah. I think one more thing that we might want to think of is when the voter guides come out. I think people get so overwhelmed by those that sometimes they will just cross them out and they'll just start either they won't vote. Or they'll just mark whoever. If it's not obviously yeah. the top presidential candidate, right. I mean, that's what we have made some forms to explain what does this proposition mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, Which our, we can do. And our, yeah, and that's really good too because some of the stuff is really complicated. I mean, we'll have the guide. We will have a guide for the presidential race and for the for the um, governor's race. And after that, and schools can complete. We have a thing. I don't know if on our site yet, but we have the, a resource to sort of like. This is how you can create guides yourself for like, because like we tried to do congressional races and we just kept running out of time, you know. Yeah, but I think you know we can certainly get local yeah. people to come and do that for us because I think I mean I know even for myself I mean reading some of those propositions. Like, oh, it's really confusing. What? Yeah. Which way am I supposed to go? Yeah. I saw my dad. Yeah. 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 Um, I think I like the idea because it's also about getting the word out. I mean, there's a lot of folks exactly. around here, and students get a lot of emails that I know. honestly I just say, okay, that heading doesn't sound that important. No, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, again, talking to classrooms, um, you know, non biased, hopefully, just right. letting them know that it's there. Mm -hmm. I think so too. It is hard to figure out how to get the word out because there are so many. Yeah. I mean, you know. Students and, you know, you know, I think you do them up with, you know, you have the vis personal visibility, 
you do the email and social media and you know text if you can get the numbers and you do the conversations and we did like on voting we won't do one for Washington probably because you just you know we can only vote for so many states but we did these posters on voting rules for the states that often were just here it is what you have to bring and we could make do a program we just have to we would just do a little bit more work you know but it's we run out at a certain point we kind of we prioritize the states with the most confusing laws. Yeah, you know, because they're the most confusing laws. <laughs> right. You know, and we have partners who do it. Well, couldn't they come up with a or something? Yeah. To organize some of this and then get a core group of students that's really interesting. Yeah. We could probably do some exciting things. I'm saying we could do like parties, we could have a tip other gallons. I mean, there's another stuff. Yeah, we could, you know, you could even collaborate, like, it would be interesting ideas, like to collaborate with, oh, what's that? That arts, well, it's point, but I think the one that's kind of down by, uh, by on Western, on oh, the Art, Art Institute. Institute. Oh, yeah, Art Institute. Mm -hmm. You know, like <coughs> we had like I mean, Art Institute of Maine did this. They did this po election poster contest. They are really cool. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like yeah, you know, come up with some cool stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. you have say we have a new Oh, you do. Okay. Yeah, I bet it does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, so yeah, every graphic design, you know, is, you know, then it's like pull them in, because that's the thing. Is like they're not like, well, you know, I'm really busy, but like, oh, yeah, if it's graphic design, mm -hmm. I can do that. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, yeah, Many yeah. thanks. Where did the sheet go? The sheet. Oh, went? Yeah. Where? Oh, here it is. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll copy this. So are we actually? I guess we did that. But I'll copy some of